the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Duke of Rothsey for coming to Parliament today and leading us in the state opening. And Chamber clear quietly. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Duke of Rossi for coming to Parliament today, for leading us in the state opening with the address that we had, and to send the best wishes from everyone across the House, and certainly from our own benches, to the Queen on what is such a momentous year for her. We also need to reflect on those that we have sadly lost over the course of the last session of Parliament. And we think of James Brokenshaw, uh, we think of David Amos, and of course we think of Jack Dromey. Three outstanding but different parliamentarians, all who I think were a fine example to all of us of how to conduct uh, ourselves in, in this place. Uh, let me thank the member for um, Beverly and Holderness for his moving of the, the motion this afternoon on erudite uh, trophies round his history in, in, in government, uh, and I hope he's still got a, a lot to, to, to give. He's made it very clear that he was removed early from office by the Prime Minister, and perhaps he still has some, some days ahead of him. But I think it's important that he stressed that the, the unity that there is in this House on the topic of Ukraine, that we all stand together, that we all stand together, Mr Speaker, with our friends in Ukraine, and standing up for the warmonger, the war criminal, that still resides in Moscow. He will face justice, and we will make sure that ultimately that the people of Ukraine prevail. But of course, I thought it was interesting that the, the Honourable Member told us that the recent difficulties that the Prime Minister has had with the, uh, the Metropolitan Police, they are, they are not new. He's had his collar felt in the, in the past as well. And let me, let me also thank the, uh, the seconder of the, the motion from Brecken and Radnanshire. Um, I think really what we had was a, was a job application for, for, for government from the, uh, the member, and I'm, I'm sure she'll have a, a, a long and fruitful career in front of her as a, a member of this House and a member of the, the governing party. Uh, Mr Speaker, as much as I hate to rub salt into wounds, this Queen's speech has one very obvious backdrop that deserves mention, and that's the democratic drubbing the Prime Minister and his party got last yeah. Thursday. Yeah. And I know that they might want to hide from that reality, but the message from people right across these islands was crystal clear. The people made clear that this is now a Prime Minister facing his final days in office and a Tory government that it's on its last legs. And I'm proud to say, Mr Speaker, that Scotland sent the strongest message of all. Yeah. Now, I understand this might be a wee bit uncomfortable listening for the opposite benches, but they need to hear it all the same, because they need to hear what Scottish democracy is telling them and has been telling them for years. Last Thursday, Mr Speaker, saw the best ever result for pro-independence parties in the local elections. The Scottish National Party is the largest party in the largest number of councils, the greatest ever result in a local election in our party's interest. This is, Mr Speaker, the 11th election victory in a row for the SNP, yep. yeah. and it's the eighth election in a row that the SNP has won under the leadership of Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, a party in government winning more votes than winning more seats. Can you imagine that, Prime Minister? No, he can't. So, <laughs> that's what we did. What about the Conservatives? Down by 100,000 votes and they lost 66 seats ah, in Scotland. And the worst news for all of them is, after all of that, they have still kept their leader. <laughs> so <laughs> democracy has spoken in Scotland. It has spoken before, and it will speak again and again. Yep. And all our democratic decisions are saying exactly the same thing. Yep. Scotland rejects this Westminster government. We reject the Tory party, and we are demanding, demanding the choice of an independent future. Yeah. Because the Scottish people know the cost of living with Westminster. We know the price we pay with the Prime Minister and the price of being stuck with a Tory government we didn't vote for. And it's a price none of us in Scotland, not one of us, can afford to pay 
any longer, and at that I will give way to you. I thank the uh, right hon. Gentleman for giving way, and I would like to ask him a direct question. How does it feel that eight years after Scotland so conclusively said no uh, to separation, that the pro-independence parties are still getting the same proportion of votes as they achieved eight years ago, despite everything that has been thrown at us and despite, frankly, everything that we have thrown at ourselves? When will the right hon. Gentleman admit that the game is up? I have to say, to, I, and I'm going to call him my honourable friend because I, I, uh, I, I do enjoy his, his company. But I have to say to him that if the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the game is up, if the game is up for anybody or any party, then the game is up for the Tory Party in Scotland, and the game is up for the Union. And I, and I say to him, I say to him that he needs to reflect on the fact that the SNP has won the last 11 elections. As I said, we went to the public. And we asked for a mandate to have a, an independence referendum. Well, I, 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 I hear from a sedentary position we didn't get one. I would ask honourable members opposite to reflect very carefully. Because when we consider the first past the post elections, firstly, to the Scottish Parliament last year, we won 62 of the 73 seats. And there is, Mr. Speaker, a pro independence majority in the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. And we hear yeah. in the Queen's speech today about respecting democracy. Exactly. Why are the Scottish Conservatives and those in London denying democracy for the people of Scotland? Correct. How many times, Mr. Speaker, how many times do the people of Scotland have to elect the SNP into government? And Westminster says no. What price democracy? What price democracy, Mr. Speaker? When this place ignores the sovereign right and the will of the Scottish people, yeah, yeah. and I will tell you this, that a day of reckoning will come for those that are seeking to frustrate the rights of Scots to have a referendum, because, Mr Speaker, that day will come. And that day will come, and not only will there be a referendum, but we will win that referendum, because, Mr Speaker, that is what democracy is about. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does he agree with me that the reason that this shower of corrupt criminal Conservatives are blocking Scotland's rights, Scotland's democratic and legal rights, to have a democratic mandate over their own future is because they know, they know. David Davis. Mr Speaker, it is in breach of this House's regulations it is. that somebody calls somebody else a criminal in this chamber. Corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a particular member, as you know. What I will... Just a minute. Just... I don't think I need any help. What I would say is we want moderate and tolerant language that doesn't bring this House or expect members outside to copy the behaviour. I want good behaviour and I want moderate language. I want people to think before they speak. Ian Blackford. No. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I agree with my, my honourable friend, and I'll come, I'll come on to... You don't want to get into this. I will, I will come on to these points in just a second, but let me, let me, let me say respectfully to the, in particular to the member for West Aberdeenshire and from the member from Banff and Buckley, because I think they know that, that a referendum will come. Yeah. And let me take the, the warnings from the Speaker about behaviour in this House and how we should all reflect on our behaviour and how we all interact with each other. And that goes right across the House, and I, and I, I say that to my friend from, from Edinburgh South, sitting on the, the Labour front bench as well, that when we have that referendum, it is implicit on all of us that we engage constructively. And let's examine and, by all means, pull apart the arguments for or against Scottish independence, but let's treat the electorate with respect. Yep. Yep. And let's trust the electorate yep. Yep. who have given the Scottish Government that mandate to have that referendum. referendum. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the most. You know, I, I, I hear what you did in 2014. You know, the point is that the electorate are given a choice in election to elect a government, in a government that has a mandate for an independence referendum. And let's not forget that in 2014, we were explicitly told that if we stayed in the United Kingdom, that our rights as European citizens would be respected. What did, this house, what did this House do to Scotland? 
This House took Scotland out of the European Union against its will, and it is perfectly right under those circumstances, Mr Speaker, that the people of Scotland have got the right to revisit whether or not they wish to become independent. I am going to make some progress. The most glaring omission in this Queen's speech is the complete lack of any immediate action to help people with the biggest inflationary crisis in 50 years. Democracy spoke last Thursday, but it is pretty evident that the government has not listened. And what we saw from the Prime Minister today, he certainly has not learned. Because, of course, people turned out last week to punish the Prime Minister for the scandal of Partygate. Let us not forget the public know that this Prime Minister is the first, the only Prime Minister that has found to have broken his own laws in office and still sits here as Prime Minister. That should shame this House as it shames us. But the electorate also turned out to punish a Prime Minister and a Chancellor who have been so consumed by the crisis of Partygate that they have failed to lift a finger to fight the Tory-made cost of living crisis. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as the Bank of England confirmed last week, the occupants of No. 10 and No. 11 Downing Street have now led us to the brink of recession. As my friend the member for Glasgow Central has said, the very first line of the Queen's speech should have been a commitment to bring forward an emergency budget. Yeah. Where is it? Where is it? Where is the emergency budget that we need? An emergency budget to tackle now the rising cost of energy, of fuel and of food. On that point, yeah. would you I'll, I'll yeah. Thank you. I'm grateful to him for giving way. Would he agree with me that um, it is remarkable that for a government that says it cares about the cost of living crisis, there was absolutely nothing yeah. new in this Queen's speech, yeah. for example, around a mass home insulation programme, which would be the cheapest, most effective, fastest way of getting our emissions down, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, tackling climate emissions as well. Yet we had nothing new in this Queen's speech on that at all. Yeah. 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 My honourable friend is right. There is nothing in this Queen's speech to deal with the cost of living crisis. <laughs> nothing to deal with with home insulation. And you know. In the Scottish Parliament, the cooperation, the collaboration between the SNP and the Greens is an example where two parties can come together to make sure that we prioritise the climate emergency, something really missing from this Queen's speech today. Mr Speaker, Scottish Power have already called for urgent action. They have called for £1,000 bill discounts for 10 million families before energy bills rocket by another £900 this autumn. And yet, once again, nothing from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor in this Queen's speech. In fact, the Chancellor has already told us that this strategy to tackle the cost of living crisis is literally to sit in his hands because, because he thinks it would be silly to act. Silly to act at a time that people are facing tough decisions and whether to turn the heating off, whether they can afford to put food on the table. And the Chancellor, the Chancellor thinks it's silly to act. That tells everything that we need to know about the humanity and the compassion of this Conservative government. And yet, just like the Spring Statement, nothing has come from this government. This Queen's speech represents one more missed opportunity. And I can give the Prime Minister some suggestions. He could have matched the Scottish child payment, which doubled yep. in April yeah. and will increase to £25 per week per child by the end of this year. Positive action to help those most in need. It could have matched the increase in Scottish issued social security payments by 6%. Mm -hmm. It could have done what governments are supposed to do in an emergency, help people through it. By any measure or meaning, this government fails on all counts. Mr Speaker, another gaping hole in this programme is when it comes to energy policy, as has already been raised. As my friend, the member for Kilmarnock and Loudoun, um, has rightly said last month, the Prime Minister's energy strategy is nothing more than a con trick, lacking any substance or ambition. The lack of ambition to drive growth and green investment and forge the path to net zero, not to mention an industrial strategy to back it up, fails this and future generations. That lack of ambition won't help investment in renewables, and it won't help a just transition. And it certainly won't help consumers now or in the long term. The and as for us in Scotland, a country so rich in energy potential, it is fleecing us of our green present yeah. and future. On that point. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, I thank you, Honourable Member, for giving way.
his constituency and my constituency border the Comedy Firth, which has the NIG fabrication yard where many of the mightiest platforms, or production platforms in the North Sea were constructed. Would it not be a positive suggestion to Her Majesty's Government that we should power ahead with building floating offshore wind structures in the Highlands of Scotland, and that would help the Prime Minister and it would help us in Scotland as well? I'm, 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 I'm very grateful uh, for, for that intervention, and I, and I agree 100% with what he said. In fact, you and I have been, he and I have been talking about that over the course of the, the recent months. There is fantastic potential for the Highlands, and not just for the Highlands, but for the whole of Scotland, to benefit from the industrial revolution that will come from the opportunities in green energy. And, Mr Speaker, we need to make sure that we learn from the lessons of the past, that we are able to capture that supply chain. And if we go back to the 1970s, NIG was a thriving industrial base thousands of jobs in that community supporting the oil industry. And I know that my, my honourable friend, like I, wants to see the Highlands and Islands being a thriving area where there's an industrial future for us. But yes, absolutely, we need the UK Government to, to help us on that. And I look forward, to, together with my honourable friend, having discussions uh, with, with the Government on exactly how we, how we take that forward. I can see the Secretary of State for Scotland nodding, so perhaps we can, we can discuss that uh, discuss it over the coming days. Since the start of this year alone, we know that the UK Government has profited by at least £1.7 billion from the revenues that have been brought in from North Sea Oil. Mm. All that revenue from Scotland's resources, and still, and still, this UK Government is refusing to match the Scottish Government's £500 million Just Transition Fund to help ease yep. resilience on fossil fuels. And still, Mr Speaker, no commitment to carbon capture and storage yeah, in Scotland's yeah. North East. Not only is this with the West government, Westminster Andy government harming our planet, they are holding Scotland back. I am genuinely grateful for the right honourable gentleman for giving way, particularly on the Scottish cluster being so uh, important to my constituency in Banff and Buchan. I would, uh, would he agree that the UK government has thus far committed £41 million pounds to that project, but that was not what I wanted to intervene on. What I wanted to intervene on was his mention of the £500 million pounds Just Transition Fund for the North East of Scotland. Could he do what his colleagues from uh, Kilmarnock, Loudoun and Aberdeen South have not been able to do thus far, and describe in detail what is got that £500 million pounds going to be spent on in uh, North East Scotland? Yeah. Well, but, but let, me, let me just say to the, the hon. Gentleman that we have been shortchanged on not getting carbon capture and storage in Scotland. Twice now we have been promised that it was, it was coming. And we all know, we all know in Scotland that getting carbon capture and storage in the north east of Scotland with the ACORN project is absolutely instrumental in getting to net zero by 2045. It is absolutely instrumental in making sure that Grangemouth has a green chemical future. And there can be no more dithering, there can be no more delay. And the Acon project must be greenlit, and it must be greenlit now. Now, I'll, I'll say to the honourable uh, member that yes, we will spell out exactly the plan for that 500 million uh, transition fund. And I'll say to him, I'll say to the House now, that we will take our responsibilities on these benches, and together with my friend from Kilmarnock and London and my friend from Aberdeen South, we will be speaking more on our future energy potential for Scotland, because we will accept our responsibilities to deliver that energy strategy, to deliver that industrial policy, which is lacking from those on the government yeah. front bench. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you bargain for more funding. They won't Mr. 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 Speaker, I have concentrated on what the legislation in this Queen's suite fails to do in terms of tackling the cost of living crisis and our green future. But what the legislation in this Queen's speech does propose to enact is every bit as harmful. Yeah. Because at the heart of the session's programmes, there is a twin track that needs to be challenged, an attack on devolution and an attack on human rights law. As the Prime Minister gets increasingly vulnerable and desperate, it is probably no surprise that he has reached back for the policy that got him the job in the first place, Brexit. The Brexit Freedoms Bill to repeal EU retained law and the other Brexit legislation in his Queen's speech represent a race to the bottom on standards. The very idea that Westminster will be able to strike down devolved legislators' retained EU laws is the latest and only the latest in a long line of Tory power. I mean, the Prime Minister shakes his head, but that's the reality. We've seen it over the course of the last few years. The Scottish Parliament have the right to retain EU law because we have the opportunity and the right, the right 
to find our way back into the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we won't be denied the right to retain EU law, and we won't be denied the right to an independent future in Europe. Right. And the same applies to our human rights laws. Yeah. Yeah. The proposal by this UK Government to rip up the Human Rights Act is one more example of a government that is prepared to force through legislation that is not only immoral, but internationally illegal. The attack on human rights legislation is all the more concerning given the context of the continuing failure to respond compassionately and comprehensively to the ongoing Ukrainian refugee crisis, not to mention the anti-refugee bill that was passed in the previous session. The agenda of this Westminster Government couldn't be clearer. A hostile environment to devolution, to human rights law and to refugees. And that agenda continues apace in the Queen's speech. On that point, will he give way? I'll happily give way. I'm grateful to him for giving way. Um, both the Government's independent review of the Human Rights Act and the Cross-Party Joint Committee of Human Rights have found that there's no, claim, there's no case, no evidence base for replacing the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights. So does he agree with me that the only reason the Government are trying to do this is because as long as the Human Rights Act is on the statute book, it's a serious threat to their project of diminishing the accountability of the executive. I, I, absolutely. My, my uh, honourable and learned friend is absolutely correct, and the public should be very afraid as to what this government is doing and the consequences of that, and to our hard-fought and hard-won human rights that have been built up over many decades. Mr Speaker, I, I, I will... I, I, th I think the right honourable gentleman would probably accept that I give a lot of credence to the human rights of British citizens. But the primary argument I've seen with respect to the modification of the Human Rights Act is giving the government the ability to deport criminals, foreign criminals, who are then re who are being released from prison. This is an important right of a, go of a government, and surely that's worth having if nothing else. Well, I'm afraid that, that is a fig leaf, Mr Speaker, for what, exactly what is going on, which is the attack on the rights that have been so hard fought and won over the course of the last few decades. All of this is the cost of living with Westminster, and it's exactly, Mr Speaker, why Scotland wants out. So just as this, I'm, I'm going to have to make progress. So just, just as this Queen's speech seeks to... In, you know, I hear, I hear Scotland doesn't want out. It doesn't want out. I've been watching. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I really, I'm not, and I, I hope he Last local rises to his feet at some point in the Queen's speech debate and tries to defend her. Because, the, because what I'll say to the Honourable Gentleman and I'll say to the Prime Minister is, we've got the mandate for an independence referendum. If he doesn't, if he doesn't think, if he doesn't think that we're going to win it, let's bring it on and have the referendum. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, you'll soon find that Scotland will vote for for independence. So just as this Queen's speech seeks to entrench Brexit Britain, our Scottish Parliament will bring forward legislation to offer a very different future to our people, a positive and progressive future at the heart of Europe, and we are not seeking the Prime Minister's permission, the only permission that we need. You know, there we are. See, I mean, we can see the Prime Minister just couldn't care less because he's sitting talking to his friends on the government front bench. That's the, that's the, that's the, disdain. That's the disdain that we see for the people in Scotland from this government. They simply couldn't care less. So we're not seeking the Prime Minister's permission. The only permission we need, the only permission we will ever need, is the democratic permission of yes. the Scottish people. And, and let's not forget that it's the people of Scotland who hold sovereignty. And you might want to listen to this, because let's not forget the legal opinion in the case of McCormick versus the Crown at the Court of Session in 1953, when Lord Cooper stated that the principle of the unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctly English principle that has no counterpart right. in Scottish constitution. Yeah. Yeah. It is, Mr Speaker, unquestionably the right of those in Scotland to determine their own future. Those rights were enshrined in the claim of right that was so instrumental in delivering our devolved Parliament, and is the case today as we seek to exercise our rights in an independence referendum. Let me remind the words to the Prime Minister of Parnell, who used to sit on these very benches. No man has the right to fix the boundary of the march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shall go and no further. Mr Speaker, time and time again, the people of Scotland have spoken, and they want a choice, the choice to choose our own future. 
They spoke in the last Holyrood election, and they spoke again last Thursday. And the longer that Scottish democracy speaks, the louder it will get if the Conservatives want to stand in the way. If they want to try and deny democracy, then they should well be warned. Democracy will sweep them away, just as their party was swept away last week.